Meeting is being recorded. So good morning, good evening, everyone, from which of the part of the world you are joining us and welcome to Miss Connect. Connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. So WISC Connect is a community project which was started by Divya Bharti, one of the TAPLU ambassador in India and me, just to go ahead and connect to all the TAPLU champions, Zen master across the globe. So it was started in May last year. So till now we have hosted close to 28 sessions, 34 speakers, eight of them were the TAPLU Zen master, 5,000 plus attendees. We have a YouTube channel, 500 plus subscribers on that. I will share the details for it. We also have a LinkedIn group by the name of Visconnect, in which we have 600 plus members. And I think this has been possible with the help of amazing community. So thanks for everyone going ahead and taking time to talk to our community and sharing their knowledge with it. As I said that, we have a Visconnect channel on YouTube. Go ahead, subscribe to it. I think some amazing content is waiting for you. We have a LinkedIn group by the name of Visconnect. Go ahead, connect to people. Some great tips and tricks and advices are waiting for you. Go ahead, join the community and learn with each other. And as we are data company, we go ahead and collect information when you're registering for this session, right? Just to understand what is the impact of this. I think the people who have registered out of that 57% of the people are new to them. So welcome to them over here. And you can see people have registered across the globe. And the one thing which I really track is that the people who are registering for the this connect session, if they have a Tableau profile or not. And today's speaker will touch some things about it. Why do we need a Tableau profile? If you want to go ahead and improve your journey in data visualization and storytelling. And also just to make our sessions more impactful, we go ahead and try to measure which particular version of Tableau you are using so that we can make our sessions more impactful. Getting back to our today's speaker, I think it has an honor to introduce Steve. So Steve Wexler is a founder of Data Revelations and co-author of the Big Book of Dashboards. I'm sure you must have read it. He has worked with ADP, Gallup, j, &J Deloitte, ExxonMobil, BNB, Cornell University, Stanford University, McKinsey, and many other organizations to help them understand, visualize their data. Steve is a five-time Tableau Zen Master, Iron Wish Champion, and Advisory Board in Data Visualization Society. And last year in the Tableau PC conference, he was named Tableau Hall of Fame. And today, Tableau, uh, Steve will talk about why do we see so many bar charts. Without further ado, Steve, over to you. Hey, Sagar, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Uh, let me just give it to you. Yeah, all yours. Thank you. And you kind of cleaned up the title a little bit. Uh, I have it here. Why the F do we see so many bar charts? Um, and some things every business person should know about data visualization. And part of this is to help you get your colleagues who may not be as well-versed in data visualization as to why things are done a certain way and how much it can help them better see and understand their data. So um, very briefly about me, Oops, sorry about that. I am the founder and sole employee of Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. That was seems like a century ago. Um, I'm a Tableau Zen master now in the Hall of Fame. And um, interesting thing about if you put on your business card and it says Tableau Zen master, um, if you don't know that's a real thing, you know, that, 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 something within the Tableau strata, you know, so to speak. And I hand you this card and it says Tableau Zen Master. You think I'm a complete jerk. I mean, who puts Zen Master on his own card? But it's an actual thing. And I'm, I'm certainly very proud of it. Although when the data visualization community, the thing I'm certainly most proud of is being one of the three authors of the big book of dashboards. Um, this is Andy Cotcreeve's bookcase. 
Those are his author copies of Big Book of Dashboards. For the most part, the review of the book have been very, very good. It's in its third printing. There have been some notable exceptions, um, some people who don't like the book so much. This is a review of the book by Andy's daughter. This is my dad's book, and I think it's really boring because it's about dashboards. In all fairness, she was not the target market for this book. Um, I don't know if you've had experiences with um, creating a product or service, um, and then that product or service is being used in a way that you had never envisioned before. Um, hold on one second. But that's certainly the case that we've had with the big book of dashboards. We think people are going to use it one way, and then they tweet or they send us pictures of ways that they're using it that we never envisioned. Um, Here's one that we never envisioned before. Oops, sorry about that. And uh, very good use for the big book of dashboards. Um, by the way, it's it's a little difficult to, to, to interact at the moment, but we, we can in chat. But um, I encourage you to disagree with me. You know, if, if I'm coming up with something that doesn't ring true or in your experience you don't think that's right, let me know. Uh, it leads to better dashboards when you have those discussions and disagreements. But I'll save that for another time. Um, hey, in chat, just curious, um, if you could type in, and hopefully I will be able to see it, if you think bar charts are boring, you know, and, and it's okay to you know, type in either a yes or a no if you think they're boring. Okay. Dara is saying yes. Okay, and from Abinov. No, not at all. Okay, we have a fight brewing here. This is fantastic. Only hearing from a few people. So two yeses, two no's, no way, and no. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's my take on it. It's not the bar chart. It's your data that's boring. And in my head, I hear this comedian, Lewis Black. He's an angry person. and. Let's discuss this a little bit. There's often this, this desire to, oh, I got to make my dashboard look cooler. No, it's got to be, uh, I got to really get attention. It's got to be sexy and exciting, et cetera. So take a look at this data, which many of you have probably seen. This is Superstore data, and I'm showing the subcategories. And how would you visualize this data? Well, if you let Tableau do its thing, what it wants to do, it wants to do this. But if you start experimenting a little bit and you discover the show me button, maybe you come up with something like this. And, and no doubt about it, the thing on the right looks cooler. You know, wow, look at the circles and people love things that are circular. Look how colorful it is. But if you start to ask questions of your data, reasonable questions of your data, the thing on the right, it's really hard to glean anything. Yeah, it looks cool, but trying to learn anything from it or make decisions from it. And this is because humans are ridiculously good, right naturally, without training or conditioning, at estimating the length of bars. And we're horrible at judging the size of circles. And I want to try to prove that. I'm going to ask you to take this poll. So I'd like you to go to bit.ly front slash bars and circles. And if bar A is 100 over here, what is the size of bar C? And if F is 100, what is the size of circle G? And I'll give you a little time to do this, and then we'll see how you do. And we'll see how other people do as well. Make a sip of coffee as you ponder this. And don't take too long on it. Part of data visualization is you're not supposed to have to, in this case, really work hard to ferret out the values. Oh, don't type it into chat. I actually want you to complete the poll.
So I don't know how many people actually went and did this. Um, uh, this is a great question from Lisa. Are the circles, they are based on area. How big is the area of these things? What, good, pithy question to ask. All right, I'm gonna show you the results. And I'm gonna actually show this in real time with a real dashboard. So as of, oh, I guess, March 30th, here are the results for this. And if F is 100, G, the circle is 50. Look at the wide range of guesses. Only 42% got it right. And a huge number of people, you know, a lot of people underestimating, a lot of people overestimating. Now, the bar is 40. And take a look at what we've got here. We've got 80% getting it correct and a handful of people underestimating, a handful of people overestimating, and you know, a few people grossly overestimating over here, but very few. By the way, I could have done it like this, compared with the common baseline and show, wow, look, bar, the guesses for the bar is twice as big as the guesses for the circle. But I wanted to show it this way to show how wide, uh, the distribution or guesses were and how narrow the guesses were here. And, you know, let's see how this particular cohort of attendees did here. I'm going to refresh the data. And we'll just look at, hopefully some of you actually went to the, uh, build this out. Okay, and let me just look at responses for the last three days. And let's see how many response we got 14 responses from people here. And you can see you're kind of all over the place with the circles, but you kind of nailed the bars. So well done in this case. So it just turns out we're really good at this without training, without practice, without anything. Zach? And that's really what data visualization is about. It's the presentation, uh, the representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. That's from Andy Kirk, who wrote the book Data Visualization. Um, translation, take advantage of what people do well, avoid what they do poorly. So let me try to drive this home a little bit. This is the same data set expressed in three different ways. I've got it as bars, I've got it as um, different size circles, and I've got it as using different colors. And m I, pretty much everybody can look at this and say, oh, B is twice as big as A. People grossly mangle this, and I don't know anyone on the planet that can look at this down here and say, oh, B is twice as blue as A. That doesn't mean color isn't great, and in fact, you can see really slight gradations of color. You just can't quantify it. I want to go to the circle thing again, really try to drive this home. Um, concentric circles here. What percentage of the outer circle is the inner circle? And this freaks me out. And I've looked at this 100 times. Uh, Professor Matthew K did this at a, a presentation. And, and I had always done the circle side by side. I'd never put one inside the other one. And we're all thinking about this really more deeply than most would. But if you were to ask someone who doesn't really think about area of circles and say, hey, how big is that? You know, what percentage of the larger circle is the smaller one? Most people will say like three quarters, 75%, you know, 80%. It's half. The smaller circle is half the area of the outer one, and it just doesn't look that way. Now, that doesn't mean circles are bad. Circles are great. They're just not good for exact comparisons. Here's a great use of circles. Does anyone know what this is a map of? And please don't say the United States. What am I trying to show in the 48 United States here? I'd wager a guess. There are no wrong answers, which I'll 
I'll explain why in a moment. But if you look at this particular map and it's got some circles on the middle of each of the states, what do you think this is a map of? Go ahead and type into chat. Let me know what you think. Number of tech companies. Lisa, outstanding guess. That's a possibility. Seeing, you know, California in particular being really large. That's that's one of the best uh, guesses I've heard. Anyone else? By the way, usually people see, say, population because they see the really big blob for California, and then they look a little bit further and, and, and right, population dense or density is an interesting thing, or the population. The California is definitely the most um, populous state, um, but Oregon and Washington, and I realize this is very um, uh, uh, United States centric, and my apologies. Uh, for that, but those these do not have a particularly large population. Um, New York has more, Texas has more, Florida has more, so it wouldn't be population. Um, uh, you know, I've heard rainfall. One of my favorite guesses was uh, recreational use of marijuana, um, and the answer is I have no idea what this is a chart of. I made it seven years ago. I forgot to put a title on it. But there's something I know immediately. Whatever it's about, this chart is about, way more of it is happening here than in other parts of the country. And that's useful. Say, oh, gee, there seems to be a concentration of things in this area. I can't make an exact comparison, but it's still useful. But the bar chart would allow me to make an exact comparison. All right, some other things that I'm sure you're going to run into, and, and if you haven't, you have led a, a charmed life. Why just the numbers isn't good enough. So you know, I'm going to leave bars behind for a moment, but this is an amalgamation of every client that I've had in the last 15 years who believes that you know, I, I don't need charts and graphs. I just want to see the numbers. I'm great at looking at spreadsheets. I'm great, in, great at looking at numbers. Just show me the numbers. Don't bother me with this nonsense. So you can have my spreadsheet when you pry it in my cold, dead head. How am I going to win these people over who are saying you're missing out on a great opportunity? You know, to see so much more in your data. And that's when I introduce the highlight table, or as I call it, the gateway drug to data visualization. And you know, let me try an example with you, and I'm going to ask you to, again, type into chat if you'll indulge me with this. Um, here is a grid of 68 numbers. I've got four regions along the top. I've got 17 product subcategories. Scanning these numbers, tell me, which cell, which combination of region and product subcategory, which is the most profitable and which is the least profitable? Which is the most profitable? Is it uh, office furnishings in the West? Is it pens and art supplies in Central? See if you can figure that out scanning the numbers, you're trying to find where the big ones is. And I think I think Tom wins wins this one. Uh, he got that pretty quickly. So office machines in the south. Okay, that nicely done here. here. Here are the answers. But you've got to scan sequentially through all the numbers to, to do this. But if I do this, I can, you know, I don't even have to see the numbers. I can immediately see, oh, I got a problem over there. Oh, look at that really dark blue over here. And a whole bunch of other things just pop out. I can see binders and binders accessories are doing really well. I can see telephones and communication is also doing well. And I can see tables in the East is doing terribly. Tables in general are doing really poorly. This wins people over because they, they, you're still giving them their numbers, 
but you're color coding them and they're seeing the advantage and how much faster they can get glean insights into their data. So this is a big winner. Once you get them hooked on this, let me take you to the next level of this, which is um, let's augment this highlight table. Highlight table is just a heat map with numbers in it. So what is this a chart of? It is the propensity of a certain politician who will not be named, or I won't name, to tweet the time of the day and the day of the week that this person likes to tweet. And I can see some pockets of heavy activity. This one over here, Tuesday at 3 p.m., over here, Thursday at 1 a.m., and, and you can see that. You see that, okay, morning hours, this person doesn't like to tweet. Um, suppose I were to ask a reasonable question. At what time of day does this person tweet the least? At what time of day does this person tweet the most? Same with the day of the week. Well, what we can do is we can build a type of bar chart around it showing the distribution of activity. It's called a marginal histogram. And I love this. I can see immediately which is the highest, which is the lowest, where the pockets are, and I can have a great insight. In fact, anytime I see a scatter plot or a highlight table, it, within, in, in colleagues' work or my clients' work, I think this might be an opportunity to add a marginal histogram. Um, and it's not terribly difficult. You know, just getting everything to line up can be a little bit tricky. And you should get people pretty pretty stoked about this. You know, you gave them the thing they, they know, the numbers, you color-coded them, which they really like, and now you've shown them how much easier it is to ask a very reasonable question. So bars, highlight table, and I do want to discuss color. I could do an entire session on, I could do a half day just on color. And um, Jeff Schaefer and I are in complete agreement about this, that the um, this is the number one thing that people get wrong in data visualization, the mangling and abuse of colors. Um, this is page 15 of the big book of dashboards. And Jeff argues that this is everything you need to know about color in one chart. You understand what these are for and how to use it? This is everything you need to know about color. It, by the way, I think he's right, but that's kind of tantamount to saying, and here's everything you need to know to compose music. But, you know, getting back to this, um, the part people really mess up is they just think using a lot of color and a lot of categorical colors is going to be a really good idea. Um, so let me, instead of having you do this with me interactively, uh, let me describe what I would do if I were there live and we were in a big lecture hall. What I would do is I would split the room in half and I would ask half the people to close their eyes and the other half leave them open. And for one half of the room, I would show them this chart and you're going to see it. And I would say, tell me if you can draw any conclusions from this chart. So let me show you the chart that I show the first group. One, two, three. Okay, that's what the first group sees. Now, let me show you what the other half sees. One, two, three. Okay, I'll then ask the first group, what conclusion did you reach? And, and really, the bars are all the same. The bar lengths are the same. And 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 people will say, you know, looking at the first one, someone might say Tuesday is the biggest. Most people, you know, I will get rentals on the weekends is less. Rentals on Saturday and Sunday is less. I will then ask people in this group how many people saw that. Practically no hand goes up. Because here, and, and then you know, I'll reveal what both groups saw. On the left, you can't help but notice, wait a minute, two bars are a different color. Let me look at those two bars. What is it about those two bars? Oh, they're smaller. On the right, color is not helping you at all. You have to fight color. 
to come to a conclusion. On the left, it is helping you come to a conclusion. And in case your audience doesn't reach that conclusion, you can um, hit them over the head with it by curating the result and saying, I want you to notice this. So effective use of color. If there's, I'm not talking about sequential, you know, gradients of going, oh, you know, um, light blues to dark blues. I'm talking, um, if you look in the big book of dashboards, and I hope some of you have it or eventually get it, and you look at the 28 different scenarios we have in there and the dashboards that are in there, the vast majority of them only have two colors, then three colors. I think one of them has four categorical colors. The overarching thing that guides me and, and in doing what I do and, and, and I'm trying to get others um, to see this as something that will help pave the way for you making good stuff is you want to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. That's what you're trying to do in data visualization. It's why me, Andy, and Jeff, my fellow authors, we got along well. It, it wasn't like we're having artistic differences and we're in a band and one of us wants to start to play jazz. We are all trying to do the same thing, which is provide clarity, which now answers the question, why the F do we see so many bar charts? So um, I'm going to tell you about a movie that I saw maybe two, three months ago that I rented on Netflix. It's an Eddie Murphy movie, you know, all, you know, the name is Dolomite. And I am now cursed with any time I see an opportunity for data visualization, I, I go, well, why aren't they doing that? And, and so he, here's a pivotal scene in the movie. Let me describe it to you. Our, the hero of the story has just risked every penny he has to buy the use of one movie theater, I think in Indiana or, or Illinois, um, to show his movie. One audience on one night, one time. You know, he said, I'm gonna pay to show this um, movie because I think people are really gonna love it. Turns out they do, but does anyone even notice that that happened? The next scene is this. We see this sleazy movie producer reading a copy of Variety, which is the trade magazine for, for show business. And he starts looking at a table full of numbers and he sees this really big number compared to all the other numbers and sees you know, the name of this movie that's doing ridiculously well. He thinks for a minute and then says, what the F did he have? And the reason we use bar charts is it gets us to what the effity f much faster. Had those had that been a bar chart where all the bars were narrow and there's one really long one, oh my god, he would have seen the thing immediately as opposed to the luck of, oh, I've got to look through this giant uh, thing of numbers. So it gets us to the answer faster. I'm not saying you can only use bar charts, but position from a common baseline or length from a common baseline uh, works great. Um, this is my website, datarevelations.com. Um, I try to write a blog at least once a month, sometimes twice. There's a lot of uh, useful free content there. The, um, so from D. Hagee, it has a, I'm gonna answer your question in a moment. Um, the, um, in any case, if you want to keep, you know, send a note, keep in touch, follow me on Twitter or whatever, uh, love to get to know you. There's a lot of content there. Um, yeah, let's open this up for questions. And then if time permits, I may show you a preview of another presentation. Um, it's not the fact that bar chart, it's boring. It's when you try with them on a dashboard, it starts to look a bit boring. It doesn't have to be, oh, I have a whole nother presentation about that. Um, where um, if you make the dashboard about your audience member, if you somehow insert them into it, they're going to be riveted by this. How, how is the thing I'm responsible doing compared to other things? By the way, the other um, possible solution to that is how many of you have seen a lollipop chart? So I'm, I'm going to open, I think you're asking a really good question or making a good point. And I can't spend too long on it, 
Um, but let me open another, show you a couple things that may be bright with you. So we've got a whole presentation about you really want to get people engaged and loving the stuff that you're doing, make it about them. And this is towards the end of the presentation. You say, hey, this got pushback because someone said, ah, it's just a bunch of boring bars. Well, I could show you another way of displaying this and it'll look really cool. It'll take someone about two minutes to figure out what's going on and then they'll, um, um, and then they'll realize you didn't really tell me much. But if you ask them a little bit about themselves, hey, I'm a woman, I'm a baby boomer, I'm from South America. Oh, let's see how people with a similar background respond to this survey. And you can make it all about them, you know, about your audience. That said, possible alternative to a bar chart, which works just great, is you can make a lollipop chart. And, it, and it's still taking advantage of the things that humans do well. It's really just a bar chart with thin bars with a little um, circle on the end. And this, is, this has gotten me out of some jams. And I consider, can, I consider this analytically sound. Um, and it also looks a little bit nicer. So Lisa is asking, how do you walk the line between getting your message across and letting the data speak for itself? Um, you're, just, you're just crushing it today, Lisa. Um, the, this is the line between, oh, I'm supposed to be doing storytelling with data. I should be curating the results. I should be, you know, finding the things that are important and um, making it easy, you know, instead of hoping my audience will find these things. And the answer is it depends. You know, what are you doing? What are you trying to find? I, I, I think it is incumbent upon all of us to find the most important things and present it and not hope that somebody has it, but that you are letting the data drive that and not your personal biases. But that's a, that's one of the, that's a great question. And usually a dashboard kind of speaks for itself, but a story points or a PowerPoint presentation has been curated and has a point of view, at least uh, in my view. Okay, other, other questions? Steve, there is a question about, it's not the fact that it's a bar chart that's boring, it's when I have five of them on a dashboard and it starts to look a bit, look a bit boring. So what's your feedback on that? Well, that, that was my whole, don't worry about it. You can either use the lollipop chart, keep, don't think, oh, there has to be variety. If it's boring, then your data is boring or you've done something, either thinking I have to make this look interesting to make it interesting is going to take you down a really bad path. I've, um, uh, I've seen people do horrible, horrible, horrible things um, to try to make the stuff. If you make, if the data is important to somebody, then they will want it as clear as possible. And if, if your bars or not, you know, if they're not using it, it's not because it's boring. It's because it it isn't um, giving them information that's going to help them. And I have found the single best way to get this across is somehow insert the user into the discussion. You know, I, I um, let me do a little bit of it. I think it's a. I think it's the. I'm. I'm um, seen this come up um, and let me just queue up some of this presentation and show you some examples of stuff um, how do i make the data more interesting because my bar charts are boring that's going to lead you down a really bad path um, if your numbers are boring get some interesting numbers if you get some interesting numbers you may learn something interesting that's from the data visualization pundit edward tufty but let me show you some, you know, this notion of how to make the thing look better. Um, 
can lead to some bad, bad um, conveying of information, misinformation. Um, somebody wanted to do like a makeover Monday type of thing. And they looked at the, um, the balance sheet in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation annual report. So you've got this annual report, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing all this amazing stuff. And the person looked at the balance sheet and said, wow, this is boring. I need to make this you know, more interesting and more engaging. Now, I want to point out some numbers that are here. Say. Okay. $41 billion in 2013 versus $44 billion in 2014. And now look at this other property and equipment, $692 million versus 688. Here's how this person said, hey, I want to get people engaged. So they made this. And this is just a travesty. Look at the height of all these different odd shapes. That's 43 billion at the apex there versus 692. They're both at the same height. Also, we went from 692 down to 688. That's flat. That's, you know, less than 1% decrease, but that looks like a ski slope. And that that was my reaction to this, and it reminded me of you know something like this, you know where the length of the bars and the numbers that are in them just don't fall together. Um, this is an example, by the way, of what is called a turd or a truly unfortunate representation of data. Um, the way to get let me just pop pop ahead. and just kind of plant a seed, and then I'll answer some of the other questions that are there. Um, here is a, a histogram showing the um, population density in the United States, how many people of a certain age. And most of my friends and colleagues look at this go, well, that's really boring. I think it's fascinating because I think, wow, why do we have this big drop off over there? But I made an interactive version of this thing where you put in your birthday and your gender, you know, and not you put your age and your gender in and you see how much older or younger you are. And people go nuts for this type of stuff. And 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 so it's a bar chart, but they're fascinated with it. And it could be a lot of bar charts. But by the way, you can use a lollipop chart or you can use a dot plot first position. Um, hey, let me look at some of the other questions that are here. My apologies. Um, how do you walk the line between, okay, does frequent use of bar chart create creativity barrier between a client and the developer? It's true bar chart ex exceeds in insights, but most of the time the client says, give us something else or new. Um, I think that's a really good question. And the what I would do is A, B, do an A, B comparison of the dashboard and say, which one, hey, what are the, most important questions you have of your data. Well, which is getting us to that uh, insight faster? And if it's taking a long time with the thing with the packed bubbles or the curly cues, then I, th I think we've got a problem. You can still make the thing look good. And again, a um, I think a lollipop chart, most people go, that looks really nice, but it has all the advantages of a common baseline and length. Um, and how can we wisely use white space to highlight the point we want to put across? That's that's a great question, and it's and it's kind of a, a design and layout uh, type of thing. And I'd, I'd I'd say, you know, let's look at the situation and see how we can uh, bring bring these things across. But but um, uh, uh, Ulas, that fits to me under the same uh, aegis or the same category as hey, how do we use color effectively? Um, to make people, you know, see the thing, see the balance, see the differences. Um, I would say, well, how do we use white space effectively? Okay. What, let's see, did I miss any questions there? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so what's your view? So Abhay is asking, what's your view on stack bar charts, especially when there are too many values on color mark? Okay, so, I've got a, a, an improved way to do this, but hold on. Stacked, great question. And let me go to a blog post, the Revelations. 
And let's see, let me go to search. It's stacked. How to take the screaming cats out of. So, a screaming cat is an icon or a symbol that we use in the book to um, let readers know you should not be making a chart that looks like this. This was shown, this dashboard here, at the 2015 opening keynote at uh, the Tableau conference. And I think it's really bad. I think this is a Power BI dashboard, and I think it's really bad. This was Tableau's home screen. This is an area chart, and I think it's really bad. Here's a stacked bar chart, which is really good. It's just two colors. And the key thing is you want to compare overall and you want to compare the thing that's at the bottom. So the, the, uh, and I can see that, hey, January open calls, complaints is a little higher than February. If I change the order of these things, that would be hard to see. Um, you know, the issue that I have here is I can easily can compare all the blue bars and I can pair the overall length, but the stuff that's in the middle, totally messed up. So what I've developed is, you know, I just want to focus on the south. And it will move the south. And I only want to highlight the region that I'm interested in. So now I just want to look at the east and it will move east over here. Or maybe I want to sort it by the selected region. But you know, if if I'm doing um, don't highlight everything, all these colors. So now it's super easy to compare the oranges, but it's really hard to compare anything else. I can compare overall and whatever is along the baseline. Now, we can do way better than this now because you have set actions and parameter actions. So I can make it that I could just click this, that moves and it becomes the focus and it becomes the bar that's at the bottom. So um, I'll show you another example of this. Um, you give me a moment. I think, it's, I think this is a really good case study. Um, Almost with you. So try to bring this home a little bit. I'm trying to focus on my stuff versus other stuff. And okay, overall I can see south is bigger than west, is bigger than central, is bigger than east. But if we just focus on my stuff, wow, it's really hard to see which bar is the biggest. So if I change the order of these things, oh, I can see overall, which is the biggest, and I can see amongst my stuff, the blue stuff, central is the biggest. I already showed this example here, some bad examples here, but this is cool. Same issue. Um, this is uh, produced by the uh, World Bank. And it is showing that um, you know extreme poverty is decreasing, except in sub-Saharan Africa, where it's increasing. The economists took the same data and displayed it like this, and they placed the thing that they wanted to focus on along the bottom. And then you can see, oh, that's actually increasing. When it's on the top, it's harder to see. Great question. Other questions? Be showing that. No. Silence is deafening, cigar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can no other question anymore. But Steve, I have one question, and I think this is something which I have realized over a period learning time. And I always tell my customers that you should always, you should never start with a chart in Tableau, right? 
you should start with a question what exactly you want to do it and then design something with respect to a chart what what's your i think advice on that wow good question the the you know the, the you know the thing that i like so much about tableau in the beginning is it just allows me to explore the data interrogate it and and find oh here's something that's in here that that i don't know if people are seeing this then it's the well what's the best way for me to get them to 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 see this and react to it and, and and realize that there's something important that's going on. Um, and so it, it's rare that I start with the, um, you know, it's hard to put myself in the, 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 the mind frame because I've been doing it this for a lot and it's, it's, oh, that data, that type of thing, I've had great success when I've shown it this way, so I'm gonna show it this way. Um, and and just knowing that that has worked, and that's kind of why we wrote the big book of dashboards, which was if I have this situation, this predicament, this type of data, what is going to bring that to life so people will you know will understand it and and glean insights from it, and part of that is just the experience of trying different things and seeing which things get people to go, aha. Uh -huh. And now I really see what's happening. It almost has a a, a, um, a visceral feel to it. Perfect. Thank you. I think uh, I think Steve, there is no other question from anyone. I mean, just just to wrap it up, I think any advice for people who are just starting with Tableau, how exactly we can work on improving our data visualization skills and skills. And how important, according to you, is having a Tableau public profile? Having a Tableau public profile. So um, let me take that item first. Um, definitely create stuff, publish it, ask for people to look at it, get feedback on it. What a what an incredible platform for getting better at this stuff. Um, it was it was I've written about Tableau public. And how it's been an absolute game changer in the world of data visualization. It's, it, it may be the single thing that is most important to me. Um, and and years ago they had all the Zen masters you know over for a you know, summit, and they said, "What's your favorite feature?" And at the time, I think I said, "Undo." Can you imagine you know trying to do this stuff without undo? And then I re rethought about it, and I said, "I actually think the most important thing is Tableau Public." Because it doesn't just allow me to show my work, it allows me to find other people's work, download their workbooks, and see how they made stuff. Holy crap, that's just amazing. So absolutely, take advantage of this thing. This thing is free. The other thing is don't be too hard on yourself. I'm seeing people make stuff that's ridiculous. It's, it intimidates me. Holy crap, how do you make that? And I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be good at this stuff. And, hey, don't don't worry about that, you know. That, and and realize some of the, you know, the very best. And I've been using this stuff for a long time. Um, uh, uh, feels overwhelmed by some of the work that people are doing. Um, serve the data and serve your clients before anything else. What is going to help, you know, my stakeholders? do their jobs better. Let that drive you. Not, I want to impress people with how amazing I am. And if you do that, one, you're going to feel great about the job you're doing. And two, you're, you're going to be deeply appreciated. So serve your clients, serve the data properly. Don't feel that you have to show off. All right. Well, I need to hop on uh, another call. Um, and, um, delighted and what a what a wonderful um uh, thing you're providing uh to uh, you know and those of you who are out up in the evening joining me thank you it's early morning on the east coast and cigar thank you so much this is delightful thank you thanks Steve. i think it has been honored for us to just listen to you and yeah thank you thanks a lot my pleasure take care yeah be safe Bye. Thank you.